Well, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for coming to our fourth Green Bag Luncheon. Um, for those of you who have been to these before, um, you'll remember my name is Kendra Apkowitz. I am a sustainability professional in our sustainability and environmental management office here. Um, I'd like to point out my colleagues who are here today in the audience. Um, we've got Steve Guild, our environmental management systems coordinator, and Lindsay Walker, our um, campus recycling coordinator. Um, a special thanks to the American Study Sustainability Project and Vanderbilt Environmental Health and Safety who have helped make this series possible. I'd like to personally invite you to each installment of the year-long series. Um, all presentations are free and open to the Vanderbilt community. If you can't make one, uh, we're taping them and archiving them on the Vanderbilt and SustainVU website. The next presentation will occur in January of 2012. It'll be on the 25th. Uh, that's a Wednesday in the same room from 12 to 1 p.m. Don't forget to sign in as attending. We'll enter you into a drawing for our giveaway today. Uh, we've got Ed Bagley Jr.'s Guide to Sustainable Living. At the end of the series, if you've attended three or more of um, our presentations, we'll enter you into a drawing for a larger gift. Uh, today, our speaker is Dave Parker. Um, he's a lead accredited professional and owner of Integrated Green Building. Uh, Parker was born in Tennessee and studied green design for interior while living in Colorado for over 10 years. While there, he worked for Green Designer, the Colorado Straw Bale Association, and Eco Products for Home and Offices. Parker has also created clubhouse specifications for Dell Webb and Pulte Homes Communities, and has freelance design and AutoCAD services as a consultant and independent contractor. His experience also includes creation of an, an award-winning lighting cost savings presentation at Village Home Builders of Colorado, and participation in the HBA Built Green Home Program while working in the Construction Services Department. Dave returned to Nashville in 2008 to pursue his LEED AP certification in 2009 while completing a Master's of, of Engineering for Construction Management in 2010. He was the lead intern and consultant for the 100 Oaks Construction Credits and worked with Gresham Smith to help achieve LEED for Commercial Interiors certification in 2010. Uh, shortly thereafter, he worked on the rebuild of his flooded residence in Creed Hall. Uh, developing sustainability, increasing revenue streams, and cost savings has been the focus of his clients. His consulting work in the green industry work, um, keeps him busy through, uh, the, through the present. So without further ado, I'll let uh, Dave get started, and thanks again for coming. Uh, please clean up after yourselves, and there are recycling bins and trash cans in the rear of the room. Thank you, Kendra. We'll go right into the next slide. So of course we want to thank all the people here that made it possible for me to speak today. I appreciate that very much. And I also wanted to say that um, sometimes it's important to remember a little bit about history. So being that today is the December the 7th, uh, we're going to take just a moment to uh, say our thanks to those who gave their lives and gave a lot to that time period uh, during Pearl Harbor. Um, so we'll do that right now. I think it's really important for us to look at our energy future being tied to our national security, and that's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to share that with you. Whoop, there we go. As we begin right now, you're going to have a little surprise event. I don't know if this has ever happened to you before, but we want you to vote for how this conversation, how these topics are going to be presented to you. You get to vote by picking either a card that looks like this or this, but only one. You can only choose one. Either go for the money or go for the planet Earth, and that's going to determine how the topic is going to go. If you could select just one, you're welcome to keep an extra one as a souvenir, but, but, the, but, but in terms of voting, we want you to put your name and your email on the one that you want. Thanks. The one that you want to vote for. And you just put that on the back here of either one that you choose. While you do that, I'll let you know that we're going to be giving out prizes today. Some of the prizes that we're going to be giving are a little bit bigger than the others, but for the most part, you have an opportunity here to let you receive the question and answer process first, and then at the end, I'll be happy to cover that at the end. So there's an opportunity for you to get engaged right away with some of the fun things that we're going to be doing here and also have an opportunity to win some fun prizes. As we speak, some questions will probably come up. I encourage you to go ahead and write them down. That um, she's holding a, a something with a pen, so anyone who needs a pen, we've got extra pens. 
They're not green pens, but they're being used, so that's a little bit sustainable to keep them uh, in the pocket being used. And right now, has everyone had a chance to fill out their cards? Can you raise your hand if you filled out your card? Great. Show me your cards, please. Money, 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 money. We've got two monies and four spaceship Earth, or just paper and plain Earth. Great. Well, what that says is that we're, we have several people here who have a lot of uh, interest in what effect our utilities will have upon the Earth, what the impact will be. And other people want to know what things cost and how to get more information and how they can utilize the utilities through the information presenting. I have good news. We're going to cover both. Here's what the topics are specifically. We're going to cover both the work and the home with a focus on recognizing that in the workplace, often it's centralized vampire energy loss, which we'll explain more in just a moment, or in the home, it may be considered decentralized uh, energy home loss. We're going to cover all of the cost saving issues from lighting to temperature control to all of the other issues that come up. Uh, we're, we're going to bring in the topic about fans. A lot of people are surprised to find out that fans can really make a huge difference, but no one has never quantified it for them before, so they never knew, really knew what they were getting. You'll find about that too. And then finally, we'll talk about ventilation, something that most of us don't think about. We just take for granted that air is coming in and air is coming out uh, in the home building industry and certainly in the commercial industry. When it's not right, we certainly find out about it. So we'll want to cover that as well. And then the water use reductions and conservation issues are obviously a huge part of the process of looking at the utilities. We're becoming more and more dependent upon the shrinking amount of water that's in our society that's available for use. And it's being used very rapidly right now out west where the shortages are showing up a lot faster than they are here in Tennessee. OK. We're going to skip this kind of vampire energy loss and focus on this kind of energy loss. Anything from computers to heaters to stereos to air conditioners. But uh, if you have any questions about the other one, we'll talk about that afterwards. OK, so now here comes the facts. And there's a lot of facts out there. I highlighted the ones in red that I really wanted you to, to see. I'll talk about some of them on all these pages. Other ones I won't talk about at all. We're not going to read everything on the pages. So make it fun and exciting for you to just see some of the new information that just came out in the last few years. Some of it just came out in the last month. When we're talking about what is vampire energy loss, look at all those funny names that they have for it. I mean, no one's on the same page. Everyone's coming up with different ways to describe it, and yet, it represents $10 billion worth of loss. So why don't we get together and call it one thing so that we all focus on solving the problem is something that a lot of people should be asking themselves. You can see right here that 500 billion electronic vampire devices and appliances are sold every single year. Wow. Am, am I the only one that's saying wow? Anyone out there saying wow? I mean, that is huge. That's a huge number that we're losing electricity every single day on. Let's talk about how to solve that. All right, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like to spend a lot of money. When I like to fix a problem, I like to do it at a reasonable cost. I like to get my return on what I'm spending, even if it's for something for my own home. So that's when they came up with this kilowatt. You can get this eBay, any, you know, any of the different places. You can go to any of the different companies will do it for $20. You just plug right into there. It'll give you a reading of exactly how many watts are being used. It has a way of calculating the cost. It, you do the research on uh, the web about comparisons to see if you're in line. Uh, and suddenly you realize, oh my gosh, that refrigerator that we've been using for the last five years is costing me an extra $150 a year. Why would I want to throw my money away on that? It's old, and what can, you know, how could we reuse it? How could we find better use, or how could we get better, better, better uh, energy use out of that? Now, all right, this one right here. Okay, I admit, why would anyone 
get a remote control power strip. Can anyone guess? Power strip. Why would, why would you get a remote control? Yes, in the back. Power strips sometimes are way behind entertainment centers and things where you can't reach them. Perfect. Exactly. And also think about our demographics of some folks don't like to bend in soup when they're in their suit to get ready to go to work. You know, even if it's only underneath the uh, desk or your, your work desk or something like that. I mean, you're all dressed, you're all ready to go, and you go, mm, I forgot to you know, take care of the computer, or I forgot to take care of the toaster oven, or I forgot to take care of something, the coffee maker. That way, you don't have to go under, and then you don't have to pull the plugs also. So these technologies, this one, as I understand it, came out in the last two months, so, and at a price of $32.99, sounds pretty reasonable. I mean, I know you can get one for $10, maybe even less on you know, specials uh, at a Home Depot, but if you had to get one that was, was wireless, you can do the math pretty quickly and figure out that if these things are being measured by your kilowatt as to really taking a lot of vampire energy out of your system, it'll pay back for itself very quickly, and then from then on, you're just making money for the future. Has, have everyone ever heard of these type of products before? Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys are sharp. Oh, I'm going to have to do something incredible to impress you. All right. How about eye control? Have you guys done heard about eye control? OK, good. Uh, here's, here's what eye control can do. <sighs> Complete system management, just like they have in the big facilities. Those of you that have been to hotels, been to major arenas, things like that, usually they have some sort of computerized program taking care of all the details. This is the same situation again, where you have that power at your home. You can do it by your cell phone. That's an uh, iPhone right over there. Um, but you, you know, probably the, uh, the Google-based uh, phones would work just as well with that as well. So what the, as you can see, it's a real nice improvement over that. Now, I don't have an exact cost on this because it varies based upon how many things you have attached to it. If you put the refrigerator on it and then you've put the microwave on it, it, it every, everything that you add obviously adds cost to it. It's a very low maintenance fee per month is like $15, so it's very reasonable to do the actual monitoring of it. But uh, it's just something to think about in terms of where are we going and how much money will you make off of this by investing in something like this. And then you add in also the security. Once you have that, you have the security of knowing things are turned off so you don't have to worry about fires. You know, and you have other safety issues taken care of if you want to tie it into an uh, alarm system for your home. And suddenly you've become completely wired and you're ready to go by starting with just energy efficiency, which pays for itself. All right, $50, $50, you're a tough crowd here. Let's see what I can do to get some uh, interest here. Pulling out the old wallet here. All right, this is a real $50 bill. Who in this audience would like to have $50? Anyone? Arms up? Yeah. <laughs> That's good, that's good. All right, let me tell you how you do it. Who in this audience has a computer? Oh, well, you guys are doing great, all right. All right, how many of you are already on low, low power sleep mode? How many of you are already on that? Three of you, four of you, good, good. The rest of you, this is your chance to make the $50. All you have to do is uh, go onto your operating system Follow the instructions on how to bring it to a low power mode, and you can save $50 per. Sorry, this is not one of the prizes. Okay. Um, but I did want you guys to know that that calculator is out there. It's called the Energy Star Computer Power Management Savings Calculator, and it does en enable you to work with your existing computers. But we're also talking about businesses here. What if Vanderbilt or some other company said, Everyone's going to start doing this. And in the past, only a handful were doing it, like in this room. Suddenly, you go from $50 to maybe $5,000, $10,000, maybe even $100,000 if that many uh, computers were affected. So just think about that in terms of uh, what you would like to promote in terms of uh, going that direction. Well, why stop at $50? There are so many other ways to make money for yourself when you're talking about working with utilities. You've got appliance calculators, dryer calculators, refrigerator calculators. All these are available through energyright.com. Has everyone heard of EnergyRight? Did you know they had these calculators? Yeah, I think it's something new, actually. So something to take advantage of. 
something to work with. All right. And if we want to talk about serious big money, then we talk about what's going on currently uh, with the Recovery uh, Act. And what we have right here are examples with 58 energy efficiency programs. Now, I knew there were some programs going on. I'd heard of, you know, like uh, weatherization and a few other things. Did anyone know there was 58? Did you, anyone think it was that big? It's huge. And in, in categories that, that really affect every part of our office and homes. So this is an opportunity to take full advantage of this. And they even have some green job training projects underway as well. So just so that you know exactly what they're called, here they are. Um, I was pleased to find out that they are including vehicle technologies in the energy efficiency project. I would have thought with the focus on electric cars, maybe they would have been a different category. So maybe we are going to see some improvements in the, the uh, car use. And speaking of cars, how about a quiz where you really do win a prize? Guaranteed, no games, no $50 games. The question is, and this will be the first person who raises their hand and answers correctly. Okay. Which energy conservation is the most impacted through electric vehicles? Your choices are battery storage of energy, B, reduction of coal powered electric plants due to efficiency reasons, C, increase in nuclear power plants for cars, creating more, more uh, energy use for them because there's more cars now, or D, all of the above. Anyone? Anyone? D? D? Close. Anyone else? One of you got to get it because there's a, more of you than there are answers. Okay. I'll get the second one. Second one. Good guess, but not the answer we're looking for. One. So the first one, battery storage of energy. Tell me why. Let him choose whichever one he wants. That's absolutely correct. And one more thing that I'll add to that is something that's come out in the media. Think of hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of cars in the futures that are now bringing in electricity and now have a storage for it. Everyone knows how expensive it is to store electricity. And no one really came up with a way to make it inexpensive or a way to get it all into those places. Now, I don't know if they can bring it back out again, but it is a way to go ahead and take that excess energy, electricity, and that's part of our utilities. And if they make money off of that, that means the rest of us will benefit and we'll have lower costs on our electricity. Now, to cover the, uh, the winner gets a choice between a leaf car special bracelet commemorative of this year, very unique collector's item, or a Bridgestone tire gauge, which is great for efficiency. <laughs> Congratulations on winning that. All right. To answer your question about the other two, when you talk about reduction of coal-powered electric plants due to efficiency, There's truth that the cars will be more efficient. They do get more um, miles per gallon. But if history proves to repeat itself, and often it does, people will then use more. So they'll go, oh, I can get 100 miles per gallon of electrical. So I'm now going to go drive to St. Louis instead of just going to Atlanta or something like that. So those kind of decisions, it's hard to measure, but it's possible. And then the one about uh, increasing nuclear power to go with D as well. Well, it could happen. I mean, we will, we will need more electrical resources, and nuclear is being weighed in terms of cost-benefit ratios, so that remains to be seen. But that would not be conservation. That would be increase. So that's the reason why I did it. That's kind of a, my questions are a little tricky. I get a little tricky. Sorry about that. But you guys did good. Okay. Smart crowd here. Everyone's probably heard of automatic setback for thermostats, right? Okay, how many of you, raise your hand, knew that they're no longer considered good? Good, all right, all right, I got one, all right. I brought something to you that you didn't know. It just came out just a short while ago 
the reason why they're not considered good has more to do with the fact that people aren't using them correctly. 50% of the people who try to use them put it on hold so it does absolutely no measurement whatsoever. Another 20% of homeowners have it on the wrong day. Now this is a quick down and dirty thing, but remember the days when the VCRs first came out? Do you remember hearing about how everyone couldn't program their VCR? It's basically the same thing all over again. So that is history repeating itself. If they designed it so that it was easy to use and they didn't have to think about it, we probably wouldn't have that issue. Luckily, someone has. There's a great piece from Academia right here about how they're making it easier and how they're using metrics so that people can do it. And Consumer Reports is promoting themselves as well, the ones that can go ahead and find opportunities to go ahead and take care of that. So that's uh, something that you can think about in terms of if you have one and you want to check it today when you go home, check and see if it's on the right day. Check and see if it's on someone accidentally or a power went down and it went on hold and you didn't even notice. It's true, with it being an individual monitor just on the side of our walls, that it might miss that opportunity and then all the money that's supposed to be saved actually could cost us more. That's the hard part, is that if it's set incorrectly, it can actually cost you more than if you didn't have it at all. So that's new information that's just come out. The question is really not that it is not a good thing, it's just people not using it correctly. That's the only thing that makes it, that's right. The only thing that makes it not a good thing is when people don't use it correctly. But that's, that's true of everything, but the reason why it's been taken off of the list of good things to recommend is that so many people aren't using it correctly and, they, and that actually can drain out more energy during those time periods that it's marked incorrectly than it would have been used if they had just had a traditional dial with a mercury uh, switch. Yes? And what if you do have one of those sort of just traditional dials? Is it better to take the thermostat back to a certain temperature? Or do they have them in there? Yes. I, I think any time you've got something and you do it manually and you have the time to do that, you are, you're doing great. And that's also for people that open their windows to bring in natural daylight when it's warm or even when, it, when it's warmer outside or the sun's coming in from outside to bring the inside into the inside when maybe it's a little bit cooler during this time of the year is a great example. Unfortunately, um, they, a lot of people ha don't have the time to do that. And that's when this program for the automatic setback was created. And it works great if you're running it great. So yeah, it is still an excellent tool. But if it's not used correctly, then it can be actually detrimental. Well, let's. Uh, you turn it off and then turn it back on to get that's a good question. And the answer that I've received on that is you never want to turn it off and allow all that energy to fall out of the house and then have to spend all that energy bringing it back in. So you will have to work within your budget, your comfort zone, and your ability to monitor it to determine what would be the best temperature. Uh, they often recommend 68 degrees is one that's come up a lot during the winter time, uh, 72 in the summertime, but these are benchmarks. If you're like me, my, my thermostat is at a location that can be misleading for the rest of the house. I didn't put it in there myself. So if you've got it in a place that does not represent what it's gonna be like in important rooms that you use a lot, then you have to adjust it again accordingly. And then the most important thing is to know where other sources of air are coming from. If you have above you very little insulation in your ceiling and that's a cold, drafty hallway, that would be a difference as opposed to that's a very warm hallway and we always enjoy being in there. So you have to measure it based upon those factors as well. That's the reason why all of this conservation and all this utility use usually does come down to specific measurement. And that's why uh, tools like the kilowatt are just knocking it out of the park because they do speak specifically to your own home. You measure it on that basis. I recommend for you, go ahead and experiment. Now, that doesn't mean go down to 50 degrees, but I mean in terms of what you are uh, seeing, and also if you wanna get involved in this, you could also look at how much you're paying per month 
and compare that to Tennessee averages or Nashville averages. NES produces uh, a wonderful listing of all the different uh, averages of what everyone else is paying, and you can see if that seems to fit with what your expectations are of what you are paying. The other benchmarks are there as well. So you can look at it financially, and you can look at it comfort-wise. Um, the bottom line is that if you are able to function well on lower temperatures, go as low as you can. If you're not able, then bring it up and be, be productive that way if you can afford it. All right, let's see where we are now. Okay. For those of you on the business side, this might be very interesting to you. Apparently, in the workplace, the temperature, like we were just describing with her home, is a very hot legal issue. I mean, it is causing a tremendous amount of money is being spent on litigation, whether it's pursued or just dropped at some point. It's still costing employers a lot of money because of the fact that it can be a disruption in the workplace. Now, with no prize, no, I'll tell you what, I'll throw a prize out for this one. Who can guess what would solve this like that? And there would never be any discussion. That's a great answer. I'll, I'll give you a prize. <laughs> who else? That, that's a, we'll start off with that. And who else? These are all energy related uh, pencils. You can choose any one you like. Anyone else? All right, I guess I'll give myself a pencil because the answer is individual settings for each office pod, office, room, each individually controlled. Now, some people said that can be wasteful, but done correctly with the right technologies, it can actually reduce costs and increase morale and take care of those litigation issues. They can never say, I was so uncomfortable. Well, what'd you set it at? Oh, I didn't set it. End of discussion. So they're all taken care of there. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the reason why this started was because people started getting very upset and they didn't know how else to turn except for through legal. Yes. Are you sure the technology is available that you can individually control each office space? Yes. I'm convinced it cannot be. Oh, well, let's get together after the discussion and I'll lead you towards the U.S. Green Building Council's lead program that is promoting the idea and I might be able to follow up with you on some websites that can show you how they do it. Well, and, no, no, it I, I know the technology you say it's there, but at least pulling that this work or not. Well, they have to create ranges for the financials. They can't let them put one person down to 50 and another person up to 78 right next to each other. That's true. My belief is the problem is you cannot set a central control system that will put enough air in one place that makes it and less in the other. The way I've seen it successfully done in the past because you're, you're just, want, I don't want to answer you. I want to answer, I don't want to wait till later. The way that I've seen it successfully done in the past is when it's done through the bottom. When you have, when you're on top of a false floor and they've been able to control it that way. So it can be done, but it can be very expensive if you're starting, or if retrofitting. If you're starting from scratch and you're already saying, well, we need to run wires through there anyways. We've got cables and everything. So we'll go ahead and do our uh, AC. HVAC underneath as well, then having that raised platform and running it through is not as hard. That's where I know it has been done very successfully. But that's the only time I've ever heard of it from my professional experience. So it'd be interesting to see if they've come up with any other way. Okay, let's see where we are now. Oh, fans. Who has a fan in the group? Anyone have a fan at home? Everyone? All right, all right. Lower your hand if it's lower your hand if it's not a ceiling fan. So, does everyone have ceiling fans? Wow. <clears throat> Welcome to Tennessee. We are smart and we know how important fans are. Look at these figures. Right here, it's saying 10%. Uh, this technique has been proven 10% when it's in the winter. That's a lot of money. I don't know about you guys, but I spend a lot on my uh, heating bills, uh, a lot of, on my electrical bills. Uh, how much do you guys pay per month? Does anyone know what they're paying per month? Yeah, that's very close to the average. Anyone higher than that? Things like that? So let's just say it's $100. Do easy math, because I love easy math. 10%. So 10 bucks, just like that. 
And if you're talking about during the summer, up to 40%, 40 bucks. Hey, I could get pretty excited about that if that's what it's going to come to. We're obviously hitting averages and we're not being specific, but we're getting the ballpark of how much you could save. So that means in a given year, you could be saving several hundred dollars, possibly, or at least a hundred or two. So it's pretty exciting to know that fans can make that difference. And everyone understands the science on it. It's explained right here how they do the calculations. This um, uh, gentleman is part of the Newton process where they have all kinds of ask a science question, scientist question. So those of you that are not in the science world all the time, it's a great resource for you. And I will be able to provide for any of you that want it a PDF of the presentation so that you can follow up on all of these opportunities. Okay, another quiz. Oh, that means prize. All right, good. All right. Who, who does math all the time at work? Anyone do math all the time at work or at school? Okay. Well, you got an advantage because this is strictly a math question. Which weatherization or insulation conservation process is the biggest payoff after one year on average? Two key words. Not, not payoff, not payback. So you don't have to calculate it that way. It's going to be very, it's going to be simple there. And the other one is on average. So we're going to average the math so you have to do a little quick math rather than just look at it and go, hmm. So uh, raise your hand if you know the answer. We obviously have a ringer in here. He's correct. <laughs> going to give it to him. He's doing great. When you are talking about saving money, your prizes can be either this US currency piggy bank from SSRCX or this pedometer from the clean air. Which one would you like? Pedometer. You got it. Uh, no, no, what is this? That's a pedometer. So you can uh, uh, calculate your mileage of walking. You can take that home? All right, you're in, you're in business. All right, he is correct. Does everyone, does everyone get surprised about these numbers? We're really adding these two numbers in a simple math for a residential example. We're really saying the average is this amount right here plus this amount right here. So if you added up this amount and this amount and this amount, three easy things to do. See, we, don't, we love automatic setback. So I, I, I threw it out early as a problem, but here's the payoff. You can see it's definitely worth doing. So if I added all three of these for one household, we're talking half a grand. That's a lot of money. That's $500. That's a lot more than $50. And it's an opportunity that every one of us who have the opportunity to do this in our homes can do. And businesses can take advantage of this as well. They just need to do the calculations on how to do it and then also take care of the, the actual payback. They'll go more than one year. They won't be focused on just one year. All right, so weatherization is going to be big. All right, passive house. Who's heard of passive house? Two. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad I'm introducing some new things here. Okay, great. This is the European Germ German way of saying it, passive house. And passive house is the way we say it in the US. It's all now available in the US. It's nothing to do with passive solar directly. Passive solar is great. But Passive House is all about insulation and ventilation. The system that they use is right here. It absorbs all the heat from the bathroom, from the cooking area, from people, from the dog, from anyone who generates heat. A lot of people put wood stoves in. If that works for them, that's great. Whatever it takes to create that level of comfort for them heat-wise, and it regenerates it, and it's according to a many, many years' experience in Europe where it's been very successful. Let's talk about numbers. Your return on the recovery rate has been proven scientifically to be at 94.4%. Don't you wish you could get that on every grade you took? Don't you wish you could get that much on your stock markets? Don't you wish you could get that anywhere? Well, you can get it here. And on top of that, they're very focused on indoor air quality because if you do have a wood stove or if you do choose to have a lot of people in the house, which is generating a lot of heat, maybe you want to have some excellent 
pollen control or some other things taken care of. They can do that. They can also take care of CO2 sensors, humidity sensors, and humidity recovery heat exchangers. All this is tied into your utilities again because suddenly with something that is run without a lot of technology, something that is easy to operate and only requires that the filters be changed out maybe once or twice a year, uh, sometimes four times, depending upon the location. But I mean, we're talking about a very low impact way to cut your expenses on utilities because you're reusing all the heat that's already there. Who likes that? Does anyone like that? I want, when she said she was interested in building a house, I want to build a passive house. That's, what, that's my goal for my next house. I, I know there's a lot of neat things out there, but this is really, really cool. All right, so we have another quiz, another chance to win. Now someone else has to fight for this. You have to win. He, he's doing too good. You've got to beat him. <laughs> All right, there are 10 to choose from. And can everyone read them? Did I do a good job with the, I'm going to see how our time is. I think I can read it real quickly. There's 10 to choose from. You raise your hand when you think you found the best way to conserve water. Okay, the number one, brush your teeth with the water off. Save two gallons per minute. Number two, fix those dripping faucets. Could save up to 2,700 gallons a year. That's incredible. Uh, next one is to buy all the shower heads, dishwashers, appliances that are water sense labeled. Has everyone heard of water sense? Everyone's heard of Energy Star, but water sense? Okay, great. Uh, run your washing machine and dishwasher full. Dispose of chemical property, hazardous waste, that falls into his category back there. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the water being contaminated. That helps our utilities tremendously. Um, using mulch to keep the moisture. Water the lawn. This is interesting. Not on windy days. Did anyone know that? I didn't know that. Windy days, I didn't think it was a factor, but it evaporates a lot on windy days as well as when it's the different time of the day. So that's a huge factor for people that are in Nashville because we get a lot of wind here in Nashville. Plant a rain garden. I think that's really nice. I mean, that probably looked really nice if you had a rain garden. Okay, no one's raising their hand yet. Use a rain barrel to collect because 40% of the average home water's use is actually outdoor. Did you, all, did you all know that? That means almost half of every bit of water you use, you use out in the yard. All right, time's up. Any answer is accepted? Thank you. Yes, we have another winner. Who else has an answer? Um, yeah. Fixing dripping faucets. Yes, we have a winner. Keep answering, guys. Energy efficient, or I'm sorry, water efficient appliances. That's correct. Are you guys getting a theme here? If it's, the answer is they're all correct. Go ahead and say another one. You can still win. I'll still let you win. Go ahead, say something. Just any one of them that you like. Turn off the water when brushing your teeth. Ah, excellent. Now all these are fun pencils about the um, a, a economy. Run the washer and dryer. All right, good, good. <laughs> and your answer is? All right, so we're moving along. And if any of you guys want to research this more, the reason why we went with the American Rivers organization is because the water movement is being bolstered by the U.S. Green Building Council program. The U.S. Green Building Council with every building that's being commissioned and then receiving certification, they have to do at least a 20% reduction. Now 20% doesn't sound a lot to you and me, but if you're talking about a mega building and they use 100,000 gallons, let's just say per month, that's a huge amount off and they have to think very creatively how to do that. Now the folks that are involved in existing buildings have made it more stringent. 20% is just one of the things and they have to do other things as well. Sometimes they have to completely redo all of the existing plumbing if they can't prove how much it's taking or they can do metering and submetering. Has anyone ever heard of metering and submarining and uh, on a business application? Anyone? I'll say real quick. Metering 
like our homes, measures it. But submarines knows we know exactly where it's coming from. So if we see it coming from the boiler, or if we see it coming from, if they have a swimming pool at a hotel, or you know, they can measure it out completely so they know exactly the areas that are taking all their water and what they're spending on it, and they can make decisions accordingly. So that's pretty cool. And then the other way, you know, you know, everyone wants to know what will move the market. When I researched this, not much is happening unless it's legislated. So when they started requiring this in Los Angeles, that's what happened was they started building or they made sure that that was available. You're not going to find too much technology going beyond, stretching beyond what's required because they're already bringing it down so low. So what you want to keep your eyes on in terms of what's going to happen is the legislation. And then you'll see exactly what kind of fixtures you might want to buy for your home. Watch and see what they do with business. And business will drive what happens at home at your residence. Oh, yeah, there we go. So um, we're coming to the end here. This is uh, something that one of my personal passions. I may wear the Coca-Cola hat here about giving it back, but there's, it's kind of like Nike, go for it. There's several reasons why you want to find someone that you want to get involved in. One of the organizations that I got involved in this year is the Green Home Tour, so that Nashvilleans could actually look at homes that are doing a lot of things we talked about with their utilities, cutting their costs, adding insulation, doing things of that nature. What I encourage everyone here to do is to pick something that they're passionate about. These folks right here said, hey, we can get these old dams and old blockways that aren't working out of the way so we can clean up those rivers and use them for fresher water, which helps out the utilities. But we can also help the ones that are currently needing more uh, support, and that's the 16,000 megawatts of hydropower where the owners went ahead and invested into the area. So it built up the economy. And the same thing happened with this. We now have people that are really interested in getting their homes brought up to green standards. What we're really talking about is cost savings at the beginning and then working it through to the other things that they're passionate about for their homes, whether that be solar, geothermal, which is a major savings as well. Okay, we have one last quiz because time is getting late. All right, final quiz with the papers in front of you because everyone's going to turn in their paper, and I promise you don't have to get anything that you don't want. Um, list as many energy conservation topics as you can in 60 seconds. Go. You want to write it, write it, write it. Ten more seconds. Okay, pencils down. With your finger, go ahead and count out the number that you got and give me a, a number of the total that you got and we'll see who the winner is. And you don't have to get anything you don't want. So, what, how many did you get? I got six. That's great. And you? Got five. Five, that's excellent. Six, okay. Six and six. Oh. I'm trying to think of a way. I only have two prizes. I've got to think of how to be creative on this. All right. There's four people. Oh, what the heck. We'll just give a prize to everyone. How's that sound? <laughs> Except for you. You don't have to get into jump. Okay, who had six? Raise your hand. Okay, we have for your home, you can put these on your wall plate to insulate it to keep the cold air from coming in, or a video on biofuels, the wave of the future, or the U.S. Green Building Council high performance buildings, 
or pad right here from the EPA. I bet he would like that. And the bookmark that you can plant or the US Energy Cozy. Which one? Biofield. You got it, sir. Congratulations. I'll take the switch outlet. Excellent. Great choice, what we talked about, exactly. And you get a price too. Yeah, I'll, I'll get her a sec. Oh, okay. You get a price too. You can have, um, you can plant this. It's a bookmark and then you plant it when you're done. Or this really cool um, pad that's about, uh, it's got like, yeah, okay, you, so you bet. I'll pass on the prize, thank you. All right. I'm gonna leave this up for anyone that wants to write down this site. The U.S. Energy Information Administration not only provides a major eye-opener as to how our electricity is generated, what kind of fuel they use, but it also talks about all kinds of aspects that you want to quantify down to the state. So you can break it down by state exactly what you want to achieve or information-wise. So if you're from, say, Delaware, you could look up Delaware's and find out their information, not just Tennessee. So that ends our presentation. Questions, please. Oh, the yellow one? I'll send it to you. So with fills and green things, like I was talking about earlier before you started, um, one thing I've wondered about, and this is kind of maybe a little off the topic, but if you really use recycled things like tires or plastic bottles or anything like that in your walls of your house, how does that, as it gets heated and cooled, affect, does it go like leach toxic? That's a great question. I, I actually thought about that a lot when I was looking at Dennis Weavers, who was a famous actor from many, many years ago. He decided that he was going to build a million dollar home made out of tires and cans and water bottles, and he was going to impact the, uh, uh, the mud and dirt to fit into all these spaces and crevices so he could build this incredible place. He did all this passive solar because, and he, and he insulated it uh, through natural, you know, bring it up against a hill, just like we talked about. There are two trains of thought that come under the industry. Now, I'm wearing this Coca-Cola hat. I love Coca-Cola, I will not lie. Is it the most sustainable drink I could put into my body? Absolutely not. But I'm gonna take it, take the benefits of the caffeine, the sugar, and move on. That's what they did there. There are risks for leaching in anything that is not considered um, healthy. So the, you won't have any off-gassing if it's sealed. So if you, if you completely seal the tires and you seal, if you seal the um, cans and the plastic, if they're completely sealed, there's no off-gassing problem there. However, if they were wet when you started, like you worked on a rainy day, some of it will leach into the groundwater system and you will have to address that issue by testing. Um, Unfortunately, there's, uh, I have yet to find a perfect solution to that kind of wish to recycle. That's an incredible. Yeah, yeah, they did actually. Wine bottles. Yeah, wine bottles have been used quite a bit in a lot of um, uh, uh, very uh, eco-sensitive uh, applications. A lot of times, interiors they can be really beautiful with the different colors and variants. So you can have a lot of advantages there. But to answer your question. You have to test. And that's true even if you weren't doing that. If I was building my passive house, I'd still have to test the air to make sure that, it, in, uh, even though they have a recovery system, that I'm not going to get sick from the air. Let's say you tested it and it was a problem. Is there a way to get it out, or do you just sort of have to tear the whole thing down and start over? Well, we have an EPA spec, uh, expert here in the room, and he will, <laughs> he's running now, he's running for the door. He will, he, I think he'll add to this if, if, if I miss the mark in any way, but. Um, there are mitigation issues for every kind of situation that we can think of, except for maybe anthrax or something really, really bad. So if we're talking about uh, taking care of it, mitigating it, removing it, is, that's basically what it comes down to, right? You just need to get it to a lower level, whatever way, you, whatever method you yeah. do, right? That's correct. So.
Mobile see paint and Mobile see carpets and things like that are always recommended by the U.S. Paint Building Council. And then the tires aren't shredded, like they're the whole tires where you can sort of tell the dirt on them. Right. Is that less harmful than if they're actually shredded up, or does it make no difference? Uh, it would make a difference, because the more surface area you have, you know, the more off-gassing you're going to have, number one. And secondly, the exterior of the tire wasn't made to emit those kinds of gases. It was, it was made to withstand weather conditions and road conditions and so on, whereas the interior is not. Yeah, so, I so I think by shredding it, you probably create some more off -gassing. The application is key, because what you're talking about is building a foundation wall, maybe, uh, you know, with tires. I, pounding them and then putting them on top of each other, yeah. but they're still going to be covered. They're going to be, they're going to be sealed. So that ends the question on that for me, but maybe you have more questions about that. As in terms of shredding, sometimes that's used in very different application. Sometimes that's used to be a playground yeah. or used for something like that. And then what he's saying is exactly correct. You're going to have tremendous exposure. You need to be testing it. You probably wouldn't want to have an indoor playground of shredded tires. Yeah. You would want to avoid that. While you're working with it, that's absolutely correct. You have to be. Yeah, what you do is you actually um, pack it in with plaster, and it's completely sealed. If it ever breaches or opens, you have sensors actually to tell you. And it's not for the reason that you're mentioning. It's actually so that it doesn't become too much moisture and turn to mold. And eventually, it would just ex absolutely dissolve like liquid. It would just completely, like, completely fall apart. That doesn't happen very often but nowadays, but when they, back in the old days, when they didn't have the sensors, that happened to quite a bit, and that's why you don't see a lot of very old uh, uh, houses made out of straw unless they were preserved by a society or a church or a group that felt very strongly about keeping it around. But all the other ones, they can get washed away. So yeah, you want to be very careful with that, and uh, chemical sensitivity is a huge issue um, for a lot of people. In, uh, in the home building business as well. And they have to be very careful when they handle materials like you're describing to make sure that it doesn't affect them too dramatically. Exactly, exactly. And that goes for regular building materials too. So even if you're going with conventional, you have to be very careful. There's arsenic still in older wood. They don't sell it now, but there is older wood that you could reclaim that, uh, that could have arsenic in it. And there's other issues that you have to look at when you're talking about building. It's easy to test. And if you know your sources, yeah, it's easy, it's easy for you to test. Obviously, you wouldn't take it sight unseen. You'd want to test it if you were going to get it. But that's the, that's the reason we were, I think one of the themes of uh, the utility discussion today was really focused on the ability to test things, the ability to see how things do work great for some people, but maybe don't work great for other people, and the reason why they don't. And, and that affects a lot of issues in terms of how they will go forward and make decisions about how they want to save money, spend on certain features like weatherization. I mean, if I had a home right now, weatherization, I'd jump on that. I'd be like money in my pocket in one year. I mean, it's like I'd be thrilled. And that's, that money in your pocket is after you cover all your expenses. That's the way it was designed to be presented today. So pretty exciting to know that there's some things out there that can pay you to do the right thing. Anyone else? I have conflicting things about the usefulness and efficiency of heat furnaces being gas versus heat pumps for Tennessee. Right. Can you shed some light on that? Well, I have spent some time with the folks at Train. And uh, those professionals can really go into a lot more depth as to efficiency issues. But are you talking about something health-related or something efficiency-wise? Yeah. I would refer you, and I'd be happy to give you a name of a person at TRAIN. Uh, if you'll write down your name and email, I will pass that along. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, and I'll be honest, that I know enough to say there are ways of finding out the efficiency difference. And there has been a lot of, lot of uh, money spent on the heat pump 
as an incentive to get it with rebates and other ways used more than the other. But to get down to the actual engineering of it, I will defer to the experts and I will be happy to pass them, them on to you. Anyone else? It's by the tightness of the house. Some people started trying to experiment in the United States with tight houses in the 80s, actually, as I heard about, and with horrible results because they didn't have that ventilation, they didn't have that heat recovery system, and all that happened was is that like living in an igloo uh, that you have that you put your drinks in. I mean, it was horrible. So that was a big mistake back then because they didn't have all the components. What they did in Europe differently was they came up with this um, ventilation system that uh, completely captures what you have, but also cleans it and introduces fresh air. So you basically are in an igloo, but you're with one that's properly uh, refreshed with both fresh air and hot air, and, and that's the difference. And so. Um, it has to come from the ground up. I have not heard of that many retrofits. You're talking about a tremendous amount of, tremendous amount of insulation upgrades and then also sealing. I've seen the equipment that's required for this. It's a lot of tape. It's a lot of uh, you know, making sure those corners have no openings, no gaps. Um, it's like what you picked up also. It covers every single outlet, every single location. No air is gonna come in. You are sealed in so strong. Um, and then, it's, then it comes down to science. How much energy do we produce? How much of that is healthy air? And how much of that needs to be replaced with other air, even though we have the heat? Oh, I'm sorry, say that one more time, please. You're absolutely correct. What you're talking about is integrating passive solar with passive house. The truth is, is that very, uh, very few houses in Europe could do this. But remember, if you're higher up, uh, you know, up in the sky, closer to the Arctic, the less sun you actually get during the year. So it works both ways. They'll take advantage of that two or three hours that they get some sunlight, but. If they don't get it, they can still operate with the existing heat. That's why so many wood stoves have been brought into the process. But yes, it's very favorable to find as many heat and free sources as you can. It's nice to not have to worry about you know, getting the wood. So if you can find a way to go ahead and just bring in sun and create a trombe wall like you're describing where they collect the heat during the day and it slowly works its way out and gets collected and 94% of it's recovered, you know, that's incredible. That's in just a brilliant design. And, there's, and they have people doing it in the United States now. Go, jump on the web under passive house uh, as a keyword under Google, and you will find that they are doing it here in the United States finally. And it's going to be big. Thank you so much for coming.